and thanks for the opportunity of talking and sharing my research in such an interesting workshop. Um, I hope this won't sound uh, off topic too much because I'm not going to focus on actual tipping points, but everything that, everything that can happen before uh, tipping points in a biological conservation framework. And so I'm going to introduce you to this timeline to collapse concept with, with that is a, a conceptual framework I'm working on at the University of Bristol during my postdoc, together with my supervisor, Christopher Clements and Dylan Childs from uh, Sheffield University. And please feel free to interrupt me or uh, ask questions or type questions in the chat whenever you like. So for a bit of context, uh, and those of you who are not familiar with the scale of complexity that we use in uh, ecology and zoology, we go basically from single individuals of one species to population and communities, so multi-species systems, up to the ecosystems, like in this example with the single cell organisms, protease communities that goes from one single paramecium to a pond, which is can actually be an entire ecosystem. And when talking about tipping points and critical transition, often the scale in which we are is the ecosystem scale, as we saw in many different talks and examples in these days, such as a savanna uh, ecosystem that can go through a critical transition, like a bifurcation, from a healthy state to a desertified state. Um, but of course, even down the complexity scale at the population level, we can observe um, let's say, abrupt changes if we monitor, for example, the population abundances through time, like this historical code uh, data example that went through almost uh, a collapse uh, up to the extinction of the population. And so there are phases in the time series when monitoring a, a population abundance in which we could uh, potentially observe tipping points and early warning signals, but let's go with order. Basically, such a situation of abrupt changes has becoming more and more uh, likely to happen in several ecosystems throughout the world due to the increasing anthropogenic stressors that are uh, happening, such as uh, habitat loss and pollution and alien species. All of these uh, stressors are putting population, natural population, at risk of, uh, increasingly at risk of, undergo sudden changes in the abundance that uh, we can call uh, collapse up to the local extinction of the population and potential extinction of some species. Uh, now, given that to preserve biodiversity and the ecosystem services that comes from biodiversity, we need to detect the systems that are most at risk of collapse, as Basilis also was saying. And for doing that, we need this uh, deep understanding of how the dynamics of collapse to extinction works to be able to actually predict before it happens the collapse of the population by trying to understand where and especially when to look before uh, we, we meet a, a critical trans transition. And for doing that, we need, of course, to develop some predictive tools, as most of you guys know. Um, for example, the early warning signals that I'm I'm sure uh, all of you know better than me. In the context, in the context of monitoring popul populations uh, which are at risk of, of collapse, they are used specifically uh, to detect potential abrupt changes. In, and we expect some generically warning signals such as variance and autocorrelations to increase before it happens. But we know that actually applying this to real world data is often um, hard because there are some constraints like having a long time series or good quality data, which uh, is hard to obtain often by monitoring in nature wild populations due to, for example, limited funding. And also we can encounter false positive risk. So how to actually understand what is going on, where we actually are facing a population with that risk to collapse. Well, the early warning signals and other tools like a population viability analysis they share the same perspective, which is the population level perspective, because we measure and we monitor biomass or the number of individuals through time as, as the quantities that we are interested in. But if we think about it, the stressors, like the anthropogenic ones, they start to act at the individual level. 
And this is the first level where we actually could observe stress signals from the individuals by looking at um, the fitness-related phenotypic traits that can comprehend behavior or the morphological traits. This is already has been proved to be a, a winning strategy when trying to forecast population collapse in this couple of papers from Chris Clements and collaborators, where the abundance-based early warning signals were analyzed together with uh, the shifts in morphology, for example, in the average body size, both in, uh, in data coming from uh, natural willing populations and also from experimental protease communities. Considering these two together helped in increasing the predictive uh, power of the, of the signals. So from this, we can understand that to improve our forecasting ability and to increase, to widen the perspective of, of what to look, we need to include individual level signals um, in, into the quantities to monitor, such as, as I said, behavior quantities or morphology, morphology or life history traits, which are uh, information related to, for example, the um, rate of growth or rate of reproduction of the individuals in a population. But in addition to that, we also need to consider the temporal pattern, how these multidimensional signals are expected to occur in time, uh, one after the other, or potentially together. And this is where an idea of trying to conceptually draw a timeline to collapse happens, defining the timeline to collapse, such as a framework expliciting the nature, so which are the signals that will occur and in which temporal sequence before a population um, collapse to extinction. Let's try to have a grasp of it by uh, looking at two parallel theoretical examples uh, coming from, of course, uh, real life um, papers in which we pose uh, first a seabird population that lives in an area where the fish stock are continuously decreasing do, for example, to uh, over harvesting by, by man. And on the other hand, we pose a, a dragonflies population still in the larval phase when they are just aquatic and they live in a pond where an alien species can arrive and be a new predator. So a new predation uh, stressor to the, to the dragonflies. And let's suppose that we can monitor multiple variables such as behavioral traits, morphological traits, and of course, counting and the abundance of the population through time. So in this first uh, panel of the plots, we have the two different stressors, the parallel stressors, which in the horizontal axis, we have the time. So through time, in one case, the resource abundances, so the fish stocks start it continuously decreases. On the other hand, the alien species, so the predation pressure keeps increasing through time. The first quantity that we are interested in are behavioral traits. And on one hand, if we measure the average foraging distance, so how long the birds usually fly to, to gain food, after some time, we can observe that uh, due to the increasing stress, the, uh, the average foraging distance can start to increase because the birds are not finding food anymore close by. And of course, this will increase up to a a physiological level up to which they can't fly anymore. And on the other hand, we have again a behavioral shift, but the time spent in movement by the larvae can, can decrease because the individuals feel the higher risk of being predated and they want to be less, uh, they want the likelihood of being spotted by their predator to be, uh, to be less. So they start to move uh, less. After some time, by monitoring all for morphological traits, we can say that the average body size start to decrease, of course, because they can, due to poor, the poor condition of these animals that they can't food, find good food anymore because the stress keeps increasing. On the other hand, the increasing predator pressure can induce the dragonflies larvae to express higher anti-predatory defenses, for example, some lateral spines that they have and then and that help them to be less likely to be munched during the predation uh, processes. Okay, so again, if we wait for some time and the stressor keeps increasing, by monitoring the population abundance, we can encounter a phase in which 
um, there is an increase in variance in the population trend because the stress level is high, the, the animals are more weak, and they are more likely to be subjected to um, stochastic processes that can uh, trigger uh, a continuous collapse until the extinction of the population. And of course, if this uh, collapse happens in a non-linear way, this is the, the time, the phase, uh, the gap, let's say, in which we, we can observe the early warning signals that we know are based on the abundance of the population. Now, if we see these two examples and we project on the time, uh, the, uh, the starting point of the shifts from the stable condition, we see that there is a pattern in the nature of such uh, of such signals, stress signals, and we see that the pattern is constant despite the two different examples. And this is exactly what we have conceptualized as the timeline to collapse. So this is the predictable sequence of stress signals made by behavioral shift, morphological trace shift, and then potential abundance based early warning signals before an abundance stop to extinction that we expect to be consistent despite the different stressor acting of different kinds of populations or species. Now, this is all good conceptual theory, but when we come to apply this in real life, there are several things we need to do. Uh, first of all, identify some appropriate data to monitor between the several indicators in, um, in uh, behavior and morphology that we can obtain. Expert knowledge can help us in vain to be case specific, of course. Uh, a quick example could be that in addition to special pattern activities, the stressor can act on the intra and inter specific interaction levels. Like this uh, fish study found that a decrease in the resources, which is the coral cover, triggered a big decrease in the average probability of interaction between the individuals. Or the morphological trait shift can comprehend body size and predation related features, as we saw, but also body symmetry indices that can be affected by, for example, the use of pesticide, as happened to this Italian wall lizard population. As for the abundance early warning signals when present, we know that there are some general ones, but we can also use some combined signals by summing up uh, the different uh, statistical indicators. Now, another important thing to do is measuring the baselines under which we, we can define that there is um, an actual change. And doing this in, in ideally requires long-term monitoring data in stable conditions, which are very hard to find in nature. But we can uh, try to use, for example, space for time substitution, where if you have different population living in a stressor uh, gradient, let's say, from a less stressed to a more stressed, we can compare those and see if, for example, like this study on uh, Puffin did, the time spent in flight, so the behavioral shift was higher and higher when we went to following the direction of the stress. So more stress, bigger beh behavioral shift. Finally, we need to develop some statistical tools, uh, which are uh, which can help us in consider these multivariate signals together with the interdependencies between them. And multivariate time stages modeling could be one uh, potential tool. And of course, also machine learning, where we could, for example, feed to the deep learning networks models several data from different populations in different conditions, and then try to do prediction in generic prediction in new cases if we change some parameters like for example the stressor levels now the output that comes from all of this in our opinion is that we can enhance the likelihood of observing a signal a signal that is not limited to the abundance which is the, the almost the, the last threshold before the collapse can start and also we can discern the risk of collapse from when a population is just adapting to the the global change, because if we just monitor the behavior and we see that the behavior changes after some time due to the stress, but then it stabilizes, we could say, okay, now this population is, is good. It, it changed the behavior, but now it can cope with the increasing stressor level. But in, instead, it's the multi-dimensional approach that tell us, okay, we are seeing sequential uh, stress signals, which that act as a quality check of the early warning signals if they then happen to, to be measured, okay? Now, we don't have 
real life examples of, of a, a overall total uh, timeline to collapse, but in the literature we can find partial examples. Quickly on this one, for example, this uh, study on humpback whales found that due to a decrease in the resources that the whales were feeding on, there was a behavioral shift, so a change in the spatial pattern. And after some years, a study on, on the same population found that the calving rate, so how many new calves were born and when surviving, was changing. Uh, and so we can see that this is like a partial, partial timeline to collapse in which first a behavioral shift was observed by the first study, and then a life history trait shift was observed. And this can be uh, put in the timeline before we can observe the increase in the variance of the population trend, which can trigger the abundance early warning signals, for example. So in addition to that, there are several partial timelines and examples in the literature, because there is a whole spectrum of, of signals from the individual to the population level that we can observe, but we highlighted the ones that are more likely to occur and that are more easily uh, detected with the current monitoring tool that we have. Indeed, we can now collect this different type of data thanks to the cutting edge methodological tools like GPS tracking or biologging and acoustic monitoring or drones that can help us measuring, obtaining photographic measurements, so body traits uh, information on animals that are really hard to sample otherwise in nature. And even satellite imaging with big animals can help us now in uh, counting populations. The next step, um, are developing some solid base theory, which is not really my expertise, but of course also testing the prediction with some experiments and some real world data, which I'm focusing on now in the lab at, at, at Bristol University. And thanks to the work of Mark Besson, my um, previous collaborator as a postdoc, we developed a pipeline that helped us in getting a high throughput automatic monitoring system that goes from designing patches in which we can perform the experiment, 3D printing them, and using protist population or communities uh, that are have been that we can stress out until extinction, mimicking what happens in nature, like pollution or harvesting them. And then an automatic gantry can acquire videos regularly through time. And from these videos, I hope you can see yeah, the tracking of the single cell organisms, we can extract morphological and behavioral data, thanks to uh, a video analysis software and uh, an R script that we are developing. This is an idea of what the data looks like extracted from the video, HID is tracked, and we have measurements and direction uh, information. And from this, we can create real, real life uh, plots and analysis. This, I'm gonna finish here, which is this, uh, examples that I'm working on now, which the last extracted data. Basically, here we have the time points and the maximum abundance of the population of parameshums, and two different treatments, a control one in, in which nothing was happening, and a pollution one in which we added an increasing pollutant concentration through time, and we brought these individuals to extinctions. And by measuring also the average body size, we can eyeballing see that there was a decrease before the transition to extinction happened. And before that, again, in, in brown here, we have the average speed, which doesn't show a very clear pattern, even though the average values of the different replicates of the experiment seem to actually uh, show a bit of decrease. So we are now able to, we have now the potential of creating this laboratory-based timeline to collapse that we are analyzing right now. So. Uh, I hope to to have back more results, more more interesting results for you, and I will leave you here. And I hope all of this makes sense to you guys. And I thank you again for the opportunity, and, and I thank all thank all my collaborators and lab partners, especially Duncan O'Brien, which is in in the de one of your desks there, which helped me a lot in analyzing this stuff. So thank you again. Thanks, Francisco, for this nice talk. Questions, Thank please. You. Anyone is having any question? So I have one question. So uh, when you were uh, 
increasing your driver uh, what i see in your uh, timeline to collapse there are different shifts so are you then expecting that uh, when you monitor a time series with uh, increasing stress are you expecting that in your system there will be multiple tipping points that's a that's a really good question and i i don't know like for for how i designed the experiment i hope to observe just one uh tipping point potentially before the actual collapse happens but the high variability that we have in this experimental system despite all the things that we control cannot give me a uh, a right example of or I can't be certain that I will observe just one, which is a, what I would like, of course, to observe the tipping point in the abundance, which is the one we expect the most to, to happen. But I think it's it's very interesting. I could analyze with this new um, perspective of maybe finding more than one tipping point phase through the time series. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a very good point. And I, I still have to go through the analysis of this in depth every feedback is appreciated and thank you so why i'm asking this because let's say you have a, a multiple variable dynamical system okay mm. and you are playing with a parameter so yes. I, I, I will talk in terms of mathematics you are playing with a parameter that parameter is your stress area right yes and then uh, if uh, there is a bifurcation that you see in one variable at a particular stressor value for all the other variables, the bifurcation will happen exactly at the same stressor value, right? So yeah. now, now uh, as you have a different timeline to collapse, if I want to predict them, uh, then if there if there is no multiple tipping point, I have uh, there will be no critical slowing down, and I can only predict the way you said at the at the last the point before the system the abundance uh, becomes very low. Yeah, so that's why I I have asked this question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see. And actually, that's that's a good point. But uh, the, the thing is, based on literature and theory, we don't know or we don't expect uh, physiological traits to show such abrupt shift as the population abundance are known to, to show. Uh, but I think this could be much related to what the type of stressors, as you were saying, and, and of course, the level of, of stress on how how strongly it, it can increase for example so yeah that's that's a good point i, I don't have really a, a question but i think uh, generating more data and exploring this is what uh i will try to do now okay so any more question so if there is no other question then let us thank francisco for this excellent talk thank you very much guys it was a pleasure